Flashing across California desert skies, the airplanes you see here are writing new chapters in the story of man-made flight. There she goes. This is my first opportunity to greet you as Deputy Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Together, you and I must make our new agency the most unusual place. An organization that can challenge conventional wisdom. We can engineer anything. We can write the requirements for We're going to make your idea work. This particular idea is quite disruptive. A typical flight, of course, starts under the wing of the B-52 mothership. This sleek, high-speed machine would have made Rube Goldberg proud. The manner in which we fly re-entry from space on the space shuttle was pioneered on the X-15. The X-31 pretty much wrote the book on thrust vectoring, along with its sister program, the F-18 Heart. An observation of an occultation is one of the more challenging missions that Sophia can do. Right now, we are looking at the dawn of new era of aviation. Since the telescope was invented in 1610, the astronomer's lens has been partially obscured by the Earth's atmosphere. He has always carried his telescopes as high as he could. The Earth seen whole is a compelling reminder of the need to safeguard our earthly resources. To predict, and perhaps someday to control, changes in weather and climate is of the utmost importance to man everywhere. The ocean. The air and atmosphere, fresh water, ice packs, crops, forests, mineral deposits, pollution. Each has its own type of impact, but always they will be there. The X-15 aircraft. She's not the queen of the hangar anymore, although she's still hot at work. Carrying a heavy payload of instruments, undertaking studies of the near space environment, possible before only with unmanned satellite and rocket-borne probes. There's hardly any atmospheric pressure at all. So that's when some of those high altitude experiments were performed. One of the airplanes had wingtip pods on with experiments out there, sometimes a camera, sometimes a sampling device for a high altitude or micrometeorite. Dryden's SR-71 was used as a science camera platform, an upward-looking ultraviolet video camera studied a variety of celestial objects in wavelengths which are blocked by the atmosphere to ground-based astronomers. Every object on land or sea emits visible light, heat, and other radiation which can be measured. High above the ground, we can more clearly see nature at work, advancing our understanding of the Earth as an integrated system. Earth observations, stratospheric sampling, and testing of future shuttle or satellite instruments. If it takes a billion dollars to launch a satellite, you want to make very certain that your instrument works properly. Plane and satellite complement each other not only for validation, but also to acquire data that you simply can't get from satellites. Vertical profiles, high resolution measurements. The in situ data actually sample rather than to try to observe this from 100 kilometers away in space. The sophisticated airborne research platform supports scientific investigators involved in a wide variety of disciplines. Our first goal is to underfly the ER-2 up and down the Scandinavian coastline, look at the CLO and the nitric acid out in the vortex. With a platform like this, we can carry thousands of pounds of instrument aboard this aircraft. And that means we can put a huge variety of measurements on board. And those measurements all together really pin down how ozone is changing. We're asking the types of questions now that aren't the first order questions, probing in more detail at a lot of the facets of atmospheric chemistry. We've actually pushed the flying capability of the platform to the limit. It represents a critical engineering feat on the part of the engineers who work on the ER-2 to integrate these instruments. When we understand the details of what's happening, then we can make better predictions of what this may mean in the next century. Our job is to give that information to policymakers for them to make an informed judgment about what needs to be done to prevent problems. 
purpose is not here to set a policy, but to get sound scientific information on the environment. The U-2 is unique in that it flies at very high altitude, above 60,000 feet. From that vantage point, your view is very similar to that that you would get from a satellite. Gather data over the same spots here in South Africa when the satellites overpass, and then they can use that data for validation of the satellite data. Plus, we have the ability to measure in situ, actually flying through the atmosphere, and getting a true cross-section from the satellite down to the ground. Not that my flight is directly going to affect the welfare of any one person or group of people, but it's part of an overall larger effort to enhance living standards worldwide. What we're hoping to be able to see are the remains of advanced civilizations beneath the forest cover. Multiple sites all throughout Central America, from Panama to Mexico, they believe that they've discovered things that would have taken an archaeologist 30 or 40 years of digging. AirSAR is an instrument that provides you very detailed information about the hydrology of the landscape, meaning how the streams are located, what areas are wetter than the other areas. Having the platform that is movable and changeable and variable in flight and not dependent on ground programming is a priceless asset. The DC-8 has a large range. I don't know that there are too many other platforms that could have gotten us out to the Antarctic for significant data acquisition and then back to Winter Rains, Chile. We need to understand and map how the polar ice sheets and the sea ice are changing from year to year. Since we have this opportunity with a big aircraft that can carry many different instruments, we not only measure the ice surface elevation, but we have also ice penetrating radar instruments that allow us to actually look through the ice, find out how thick the ice is. In this case, we're measuring the rain and the snow. It's an incredibly versatile and sturdy platform. It allows us to fly high or low and it can carry a very nice complement of instruments. It will provide direct information about the nature of these fronts and atmospheric rivers. This information can be analyzed directly by the modelers to understand where can they improve their models. Things that study nature, they don't ever do exactly what your plan was. Measurements we make and impacts will help us improve forecasts. It'll also help us improve how we measure from space. Winter storms, tense rain activity on the west coast. We're trying to get an understanding of the thermodynamic state of the atmosphere. NASA deployed its piloted DC-8 and unmanned Global Hawk aircraft in a massive effort to collect as much data as possible. It costs about a million dollars per linear mile of coastline. We mispredict the landfall of a major hurricane. We expect that these measurements will enable hurricane modelers to improve their track. The involvement of the Global Hawk is a game changer. You can use this plane to do reconnaissance. Science is just a different kind of reconnaissance. A combination of endurance, range, and altitude. We're above the weather. We can study it with all our sensors from on top. Satellites in low Earth orbit only provide a very brief glimpse. With the Global Hawk, the expectation is that because of its 30-hour flight duration, we're going to be able to be out over storms for up to 20 hours or so. Similar remote sensors that you might fly on a satellite, and then you're bringing it down to a 60,000-foot level, that's like putting the whole storm up into higher resolution. We will start setting out specific flights to address things like air quality, aerosol of polluted areas. Measuring the atmosphere from pole to pole, doing vertical profiles from approximately 42,000 feet down to 500. What does the atmosphere look like? We'll quantify 100 gases. 250 different chemicals and ultrafine aerosol. Most can't be measured by satellites at all. Where does ozone go to be removed from the atmosphere? We can do things for climate and air quality if we decide we want to do something about that. Uh, science has a mission to measure atmospheric carbon dioxide during all times of the day and night. You don't realize how fun it is to be flying 500 feet off the ground. This big DC-8 that kind of scares everybody in the neighborhood. The DC-8 has some of the best measurements of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases. We get to see where the different layers are as we change altitudes during the campaign. 
What happens when this air mass gets up into the stratosphere? From the overshooting cloud tops of thunderstorms, see how far different chemicals have penetrated into the stratosphere. When things get that high of altitude, it gets into more of the global airstream and things can go downstream very quickly and start circulating around the globe. I can't think of another airplane that could carry this many sensors and fly at those altitudes and do that kind of a mission. ER2 acts like a steerable satellite for us. By studying the interactions between clouds and aerosols, we can better forecast models of climate. These atmospheric trace gases are important because they affect the formation and destruction of ozone in our atmosphere. How winds couple with convective systems to really either inhibit or accelerate their growth. Never before have we been able to fly a system that can measure water vapor, winds, and aerosols all simultaneously. We're trying to measure every 300 feet as we go up in the atmosphere, and about every couple miles as the plane is moving along. So this is really detailed measurements that you would really only be able to get aboard an aircraft like this. The DC-8, it's really an airborne laboratory. You're chasing things like winds, they're fairly dynamic phenomena. There's a lot of times when the objectives will change or the area that they're wanting to look at is moved based off of what they're seeing, and we have to try and make that happen real time. The aircraft will take off from the Dryden Flight Research Center and then fly over the western United States using its infrared camera to find and actually map out fires. We will get real-time information from that scanner that's related to the thermal emission coming from individual fires. The U.S. Forest Service can use that data to help plan out their resources. The nice thing about the radar is it can see through smoke, it can see through clouds. So it's an all-day, all-night imaging technology. The FireX AQ team will deploy throughout the U.S., taking measurements of smoke from wildfires. The purpose of this overflight was to collect thermal and visual imagery of some study caves that we have located in the Mojave Desert. By being at 3,000 feet, we were able to have good coverage as far as the landscape is concerned through developing techniques for detecting caves on Earth. We can then take those techniques and use them to look for caves on Mars. There was an earthquake about a week ago. We're surveying that area to see what ground movement has happened since the earthquake. The objective is to prove the technique of simultaneous measurements of ocean currents and winds from the same instrument. Both ocean currents and winds actually influence Earth's climate, and they influence each other. This should be a path forward for the next generation space mission. The main goal of the mission is to measure as precisely as we can the vertical exchange that the structure produces between the surface and the depths of the ocean. The structure we're trying to see are small and satellite today are not capable of having this level of resolution. That's the beauty of planes. It allows us to have way higher resolution. Pretty neat mission. We've been flying around at 28,000 feet. The biggest challenge we have flying these type of missions out here are staying on these exact lines as we uh, fly over the wetlands. The G3 is an excellent platform for this work. It's speed, it's range, it's an easy work environment as you can see in here. You can go wherever you want, whenever you want. And also we can have a different look and go compared with satellites. Dryden engineers developed this repeat pass capability, which is our platform precision autopilot which enables us to fly a line in the sky today and then tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, we can repeat that line every time to within plus or minus five meters. Couples the radar to the flight track of the aircraft. Right now, the pilots aren't even flying the airplane. It's completely hands off. This right here is actually flying the airplane. Flying these lines over and over will allow us to study the wetland change over time. We can look at how natural deltas form so that we can understand more about sediment deposition and maybe try to reverse these loss of sediments in many of the other deltas around the world. What we're really out here doing is we're trying to understand how much water, how much sediment, and how much carbon is moving from North America out into the coastal ocean. This time around, we're focused on forested biomes. The main question we're trying to answer here is how much carbon is stored in a forest ecosystem. These trees are amazing because they really are the connection between the land and the sea. 
Today we are over the Arizona area to look at the landslide. Measuring the heights of the levees against high tide and low tide. You get information about where the levees are weak. It's very economical to use science to determine where to best use your resources we could tell when a sinkhole is forming before that catastrophic failure happens. We can try to image the oil spill and the effects on the coastline. Looking at glaciers as well as volcanoes, which will then go on and help us do some predictive analysis in the future. A lot of it is supporting private organizations, universities, other NASA centers, but we actually have the teams and the tools to be able to take a science instrument like this UAV SAR pod and put it up into the environment where they need it. The ER-2 is a very unique aircraft. We can get a very wide swath with these super high-tech instruments. We're kind of the last step in development on some of our Earth science satellites. We actually take it up to extreme altitudes and cold so it can put it in an extreme environment. We are here to study the volcanic plumes from Kilauea Volcano. And we can have a real impact on helping people to manage this risk if we can make the measurements and give them the information they need. Knowing the spectral signature of what you're looking for can help you ascertain the health of a system. Different types of coral have different spectral signatures. We believe we'll be able to say something about where the coral resides and how healthy it is. We want to make sure that we're using our technologies to also help the planet and understand processes on the planet. This basically gives us almost the same view of the moon as Earth orbiting satellites would have. We want to know this to a high level of accuracy because we essentially are using the moon as a benchmark so that Earth observing satellites can turn and look at the moon and set the scale on the amount of light they're measuring from the Earth. We were beautifully set up to see this. We were just well positioned and aircraft performed perfectly. What Armstrong is doing to go out there and facilitate his science missions such as this Eclipse mission, these involve detailed logistics, flight planning, modification of aircraft. We're able to see the Eclipse for a little bit longer than others might. We control our timing exactly so that we enter that region of totality right when it starts, fly as slow as we can through it and get the maximum amount of time on that target. We don't have to be a scientist to really be transformed by the beauty of a total solar eclipse. If you think about what our own eyes are able to see, a rainbow of colors. But that rainbow is a very, very tiny sliver of the much larger types of light that is out there. Infrared astronomy allows us to study objects that are very cold. The center of our galaxy, in the visual range, you really can't see much because it's obscured by this dust. And infrared can see through dust. The Earth's atmosphere blocks most of the infrared band. To really get an infrared view of the universe, you need to get somehow above the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. It is a 747 plane in which we have put a two and a half meter infrared telescope. It's the largest telescope to leave the surface of the Earth so far. We don't look at the view that no one's ever seen. So you're bound to find out something. It's currently operating in a regime no other instrument in the world can operate at. What the big advantages of a flying observatory like Sophia is you can always access the instrument, you can always upgrade the instrument. We can make improvements to the telescope, we can make improvements to the mission systems on board. One of the premier observatories to pioneer large instruments. We're not limited to weight that launch vehicles require to put something into space. We can carry instruments that are hundreds of pounds. We can give those instruments much more power than you can generate from solar collectors in space. There's also time you need missions. The shadow of Pluto passing in front of a background star is going to be cast in the middle of the ocean. It's going to have the best position of any observatory on the planet for this particular event. A significant technical accomplishment of the program is the pointing stability of the telescope itself. Well, I have all the little vibrations and jumping around of the airplane. It can actually stay stabilized on a quarter, three or four miles away. It looks like the telescope is moving, but the telescope is rock stable. The aircraft is moving beneath the telescope. It's an amazing engineering feat, I think, that that door back there, as big of the hole that it makes, when it opens, you don't even notice it whatsoever. Hello, 
I'm from Sofia. I'm flying in the world's greatest and highest altitude infrared astronomy telescope ever. It's nice to be able to share what we're doing with people who will take it back to students and hopefully inspire them to go into science and technology and engineering. I think that's giving us the opportunity to gather information that we may have never had before. I've watched a world-class telescope take data that no other telescope on Earth can take. It really invigorates you. It stimulates your thinking. We can turn all of these things into teachable moments in our classroom. Having them see that it's really such a team effort, I think it's important. I'm going to be able to take what I've learned on Sophia into my chemistry, into my biology, into my physics classes, and into my engineering classes. What I learned on Sophia is you have to know a little bit about all of the disciplines in the sciences to be successful. What an amazing science opportunity for not only my students, but for myself to truly grow as a teacher. If I could talk to my high school students right now, I would just say that if you look around, you're going to see why hard work and science and math and all kinds of opportunities out there are worth the effort. I hope that many teachers will have the same chance as me. Go on a plane called Sophia and fly to the stars. We're flying on the DC-8, it's really exciting. It's a bunch of different real-time measurements. It's really cool to see how these are fluctuating when we're flying over different environments. Look out the window and you see the city, you see the smog, then you look at the screen here and you see a direct relationship with the measurements of these different compounds that we're looking at. In the classroom, you don't get that degree of involvement. Really interesting what we're seeing today, very different from what we expected and what we saw yesterday. An amazing opportunity to, first of all, do cool stuff like this, like flying a plane, and also conduct amazing research and build my skill set and network with people at NASA. You get to dream about, you know, doing all this science in the field, and you literally are doing it right now. It's my first experience with Fieldbird, really. Highly recommend applying at NASA SARP if you are even remotely interested. It's such an amazing program. Thank you.